Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us this morning. Uh, hope you had a great day uh, yesterday. Um, we had uh, an amazing day yesterday on the first day of Charcha 2020. Um, you all of you joined on uh, on YouTube streams, on Zoom streams, and Bookmesh streams. I hope you really uh, uh, enjoyed the discussion. Um, uh, you know, got to hear a lot of India's development sector leaders. Uh, we had uh, nearly ten thousand of you joining yesterday uh, across various streams uh, at various points in time, and the viewership on YouTube and uh, other channels are just growing by the hour. Uh, the great thing about this is that all of this content will be available for you to view at any point uh, later uh, or for you to share with your friends. Um, and today is an exciting day as well. We've got uh, a great series of panels and uh, speakers, uh, some of India's uh, foremost thought leaders, enablers, practitioners. Um, and I'm really, really happy to bring uh, day two to you. So let's get started. We have uh, the first uh, panel by Transform Rural India. Uh, it's a it's a topic that's really really relevant. I'll hand over to Anish, uh, and uh, uh, and he will introduce the uh, and sorry I'll hand over to Irina uh, and Anish, and uh, they will introduce uh, the panel to you. Um, Transform rural India works to bring equal opportunities to India's poorest, supporting them in their journey to prosperity, dignity, and better life. I'm going to um, uh, say that you're going to enjoy this um, this session. Please post your questions on the Q&A section uh, and we will try our best to answer uh, as many of your questions as possible. Um, and uh, if you have your friends uh, who are interested, please share with them. This is going to be a great session. Uh, I'm really, really happy to welcome the panel here um, uh, and uh, uh, all the best to the panel here as well. Uh, Irina, I hand it over to you. Thank you, John. Uh, welcome, everyone. I'm delighted to um, introduce to you a panel on how does one create rural jobs. Let me just set it up for you. We're going to do uh, three things. One is uh, everybody in the panel will quickly go around and we've given them the mammoth task of giving us their insights in three minutes each. So let's see how many of them will meet that metric. After the panel has spoken, we will have uh, we will take your questions and then we'll try and close it off with some final thoughts from a few of the panel members. But before I do that, let me just set it up for you. Um, I think when we talk about rural jobs, we are talking about um, a huge part of India and one cannot think of it as a monolith. We obviously have the estimated 100, 125 million farmers, large, medium, small. A lot of the small ones actually now are women. And so um, it's interesting to see how this whole thing will evolve. Uh, these farmers obviously need lower cost. They run one of the riskiest businesses that we know in the country. They need better price realization and over time they need to participate in larger value chains so that their incomes increase. And one question is, what are we going to do to help them participate in agri-value chains in a more systematic, deliberate and value-adding way? But we also have one third of rural India which is landless. A lot of them are employed in construction. Some of them are part of Narega. Some of them are quite frankly huge in terms of disguised unemployment and there's a question around what can we do to skill them up um, meaningfully in a very practical way and are there any rural jobs for them. And then don't forget the young. There are so many young people in rural India. Many of them have done class 6, class 8, some of them have done class 10. First generation learners in their family, very different aspiration. The land is too small now for them to go back into agriculture. Most of them don't want to do agriculture. Their parents don't want them to be in farming. What are these kids going to do? What are the services businesses for them? Is garmenting an option? If you look at China, one of the most fascinating things in China is how much of data tagging is now happening in rural China. So millions of young Chinese are just sitting there and tagging organs. They're tagging eyes and ears and streets. And it's quite fascinating to see new forms of um, jobs being created in rural China for people like this. So we're going to cover, hopefully, a lot of this in the next 90 minutes. We're going to talk about rural agri chains. We're going to talk about garmenting. We're going to talk about services. And therefore, let me not stand between you and the panel. We're going to uh, request each one of them to share with us, not to moan about what's wrong with rural India, but to share with us the opportunities they see and the one or two things that they want to see happen differently for 
our rural uh, citizens and brothers and sisters to be able to uh, capture this opportunity. So Anish, as the co-lead, let me hand over to you. Your three minutes start now, and then we'll hand over to the next panelist. Thanks, Irina. <laughs> Partly my position would be you know, called Uli, or if you are generous, wishful or foolhardy in this Swadesh way. Someone I admire through the 2011 census data on urbanization to confront me that I'm on the wrong side of history. I remember, Irina, in one of your studies, you had uh, said that India will remain over 50% uh, rural till 2050. The present crisis, I guess, will push that by a few, few, few more years. 70% of the workforce today is real or rural or linked to rural. What to do with them is a serious question and can't be wished away. Partly our quest for rural jobs is also driven by the unending search for solutions when confronted with the data on manufacturing conundrum. Doubling of rural share in manufacturing output, it is actually now more than 50%, 51% exceeding urban. But around the same time, we saw a decline in manufacturing employment by 4%. So there are obviously favorable conditions for factories to be set up. And these conditions, power, road, connectivity, would have only improved in the last decade or so. Then why are labor intensive MSMEs not coming to rural areas? That's the issue, whether it is destructive or what I'm not uh, very sure about. Or are our supply chains, the production, processing, consumption organized in a manner in which it doesn't make sense for these factories to come to rural areas? I see return of migrant labor proposals to incentivize industries in rural areas to shift this somewhat. The COVID linked consumer demand on fresh direct will guess I give a new life to clocking of carbon miles. And partly, the rural job quest is also driven by frustration. Maybe it's rhetoric or estimated 8, 9 million migrate from rural areas to urban labor markets manufacturing. Rural is younger than ever, median age of just under 28. Better educated than ever, 85%, and you made mention of that, 85% have some school time, more aspirational, but the dunes are in cities. Even low paying, staying in cramped rooms, six to 180 cubic feet, but now as we are seeing hundreds, thousand kilometers trek to their homes. There you go, chimera of better quality jobs outside villages. Worker productivity is a serious drag on our competitiveness. Then it makes more sense to relocate them, not to relocate them, have them the security of shelter and family. I argued in idea piece yesterday that COVID has appended some of these and there are possible tailwinds, shop, social distancing on soft floor, increase in labor costs due to demand supply mismatch, increased provisioning for social security, same conditions that made Silampur one of the biggest teaching clusters or enterprising youth from Baka landing as Kalipili taxi drivers at Delhi airport. You know, 70% of them are from Baka, the taxi drivers. Same things that push for subcontracting of book workers, peace workers will make in rural more viable, I guess. To seize this, it has to make for overall supply chain efficiencies and fulfillment of quality demands. To give you an example, the logistics of transporting water and offals, that's 35% by weight in poultry and three times costly by volume to processing near consumption centers just makes no sense. Some of us who are in the business of making rural enterprises happen will urgently need to attend to supply chain efficiencies and quality fulfillment. You know, Irina, it's not rocket science. There is some science in it, but it's not rocket. We did that with mushroom processing for Unilever in a remote village two decades back. Skills, fail-safe traceability, trust compact on the upside downside. It can't be a game of should be Mary, but we Mary, this needs to be unshackled. And we will have a role in ensuring transaction governance, contracts and form in enforcement on the ground. We at TRI have built a platform for facilitating franchises looking for franchisee options in rural India. Two, we have started with our foods. We have set up decentralized dalmates with Sudiksha, we have set up preschools. Two other companies that I'm associated with, the National Association of Pharma Producer Organization, the Agro Enterprise Growth Foundation, are committing and gearing to make this happen on farm produce. Yesterday, in one of the conversations with Big Basket, they were very open to this uh, opportunity, subject to quality and trust parameters, to have FPOs and agri entrepreneurs run their collection centers, which would include basic processing like sorting, grading, packaging. There is solid work also to back some of this. If you look at, uh, there is a very good study. There is a very good study on secondary agriculture by you know uh, in, in the erstwhile planning commission we had uh, professor despal sharma from ohio and there were you know industry titans like godres also and some blue chip voices involved this study indicated a lot of work could be easily done near farm and this will improve farm produce prices create rural service infrastructure and create local employment with agriculture getting center stage with covid there was no lockdown on our food and we had the logistics relatively worked out. 
I guess we owe to ourselves to make this uh, success. Sadly, it seems you know across our political step, uh, spectrum, there is a bipartisan consensus that is all about relief. Can we not put our might into pivoting rural as launchpad? Secondary agriculture, decentralized franchising manufacturing will be key to success. And you did mention you know China. And you know the way they have transformed their agro processing industry, they're linking it to advanced manufacturing platforms, bioprocessing. They're already the leading food ingredients manufacturer and exporter. In some of these, the underlying, you know, the production exceeds India's production is key, exceeds that of China. And we have decided decided agroecological advantage in many of them. Some ten years back, and I was to our surprise, we discovered in you know Jharkhand, a small sauce manufacturing unit was importing and using imported tomato bricks from China. We can look at other such species, rice mills, poha mills, are to be done locally. I don't know if there is a commercial argument or all it is only mindless emotional, but, but we need to try that. And we intend to, and you know, at TRI, we are building, uh, trying to build about 100 youth opportunity facilitation hubs to work with rural youth, returning migrants on business discovery, linking of enterprise opportunities, catering to hyper-local opportunities. Two of our partners, development alternatives here, I've been having conversation with that, head held high. So we are trying to look at how we could give an impetus to decentralized franchising manufacturing and secondary agriculture. I'll stop here, Irina. <laughs> Thank you, Anish. You very interesting thoughts, though you did not meet my three-minute challenge. Anjani, uh, how do you at Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation think about your research? Uh, Anjani, you're uh, Irina, uh, was that a question for me? Sorry, I just dialed in like two seconds ago. I was having some problems with Zoom. Yes, if you if you need time to settle in, it was a question for you, Anjani. Are you up to answering it, or should I move to somebody else and come back to you? No, I can take a stab at it. Just uh, okay, can, if you wonderful. can just repeat so, the question. No, so how do you at uh, the Gates Foundation think about creating rural jobs? Okay, great. Sorry. Yeah, and uh, again, sincere apologies for dialing in late, and uh, so I'm. Uh, uh, definitely missed uh, the conversation which has happened so far. Um, so uh, uh, thanks everyone for this opportunity and uh, uh, I'm looking forward to uh, hearing everyone's thoughts uh, on this topic. Uh, see, uh, the way uh, you know we think about it is um, uh, particularly in light of this conversation that uh, uh, agri-processing, uh, I will just dive right in, or, or value-added production, uh, I think that's, uh, that's a key aspect. And this is, uh, and therefore the conversation is also very timely. Uh, you know, uh, value-added production or agri-processing, uh, you know, uses agriculture. One of the key di differentiators of this particular sector from others, uh, non-farm sectors, is that it uses agricultural production as an input, and therefore growth in this particular sector uh, tends to both create greater employment opportunities in agriculture, of course, uh, and of, uh, in the processing sector. Uh, and increases the demand for labor in agriculture as well. And this uh, uh, pairing uh, of changes uh, is something uh, uh, we think has a particularly uh, salutary effect uh, both on job creation and wages. Uh, and uh, it needs a renewed uh, focus in India. As we all know, less than 2% of uh, uh, fruits and vegetables uh, are processed in India. Uh, compared to 20, 30 uh, percent in other uh, emerging markets, and not just developed markets. Uh, with that said, you know I think uh, uh, we are. What we are also learning is that uh, uh, in, when, in, when it comes to creating jobs in rural economies, uh, uh, we also need to think about how the sectors within rural economy interact with each other and with uh, local and regional product markets. So, therefore, while we look at uh, individual value chains, we do need to uh, take into account the broader market realities uh, within which a particular value chain uh, operates. Um, and, uh, you know, that, uh, again, now focusing more on uh, the, uh, uh, the agricultural processing side, uh, you know, we know that uh, in rural economy, uh, almost 60% uh, of rural households depend on non-farm uh, employment for their income. And a significant portion of this non-farm employment comes from uh, food processing or food related sectors could be wholesale processing, logistics, retail, uh, and, and food service. Uh, so again, emphasizes uh, the role of this sector uh, in creating jobs and uh, improving wages uh, in rural economy. Now coming to, uh, to you know, what 
needs to happen. I, you know, I think the four, uh, four components uh, that need to be addressed uh, are pretty well known. Uh, technology, infrastructure, capital markets, and human capital. Uh, these are the four broad dimensions on which, uh, uh, as a country, we need to invest uh, both in, uh, uh, in the public and private sector. And uh, which essentially then boils down to uh, ownership of productive assets, uh, particularly on the technology and infrastructure side. Now, these productive assets uh, could be in the form of land, uh, access to credit markets, uh, education, transport services, uh, and, uh, uh, is, and therefore creating uh, uh, or using uh, agri-processing as a sector to create jobs uh, one of the key aspects we need to look at is how can we create uh, or make these productive assets either explicitly through private ownership or implicitly through uh, uh, public uh, provision, uh, but it's available to uh, uh, people in rural uh, economies. Uh, I would say custom hiring centers is a really great example, uh, which uh, helps uh, increase the productivity of uh, farmers uh, uh, in India. Similarly, on the agri-processing side, uh, uh, creating assets uh, like uh, dryers, mills, uh, and uh, making them uh, accessible to a rural population uh, at scale uh, is a big opportunity uh, in, in India. Uh, and that needs to be combined with human capital. Uh, and usually when we think about human capital, uh, the, uh, you know, the conversation is limited to education and health. Uh, but I think that uh, in addition to that, uh, entrepreneurial skills uh, and mentorship uh, is a key aspect. We all know even in urban markets, uh, creating uh, you know, uh, entrepreneurs is a very uh, uphill battle. Uh, and uh, I personally sometimes feel that uh, uh, we uh, uh, do not re recognize that entrepreneurship, whether it is in a rural market or an urban market, it's equally challenging, uh, but the level of mentorship and uh, uh, access to entrepreneurial skills that is available in rural economies, uh, or let's just say it's pretty much non-existent uh, in rural economies. Uh, and so uh, I think that a renewed emphasis uh, in, uh, uh, in making those uh, uh, opportunities available in rural economies will be key uh, to uh, uh, creating jobs. Uh, and uh, the last thing I would say is, uh, you know, when we look at uh, uh, the agri uh, agriculture sector in India, or, or people who are engaged in agriculture sector in India, uh, almost 50% uh, uh, of it is casual labor, which means that there is no specialization of skills, and therefore it is largely a low productivity economy. Uh, and so therefore I see a huge opportunity uh, to create specialization whether it is through models, and some of these models already exist in the country, which can be scaled up, uh, models uh, of uh, creating village entrepreneurs, uh, which are providing uh, different types of services uh, related to uh, agronomy uh, or, uh, or market linkages uh, or uh, uh, you know, access to uh, different uh, 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 schemes or financial literacy products uh, to rural entrepreneurs uh, strengthening that link uh, between um, uh, creating specialized employment and connecting that to the entrepreneurial to the needs of entrepreneurs in rural economy uh, is that is a uh, is a crucial link that I think uh, could be strengthened uh, in India. Thank you, Anjani. Very helpful. Uh, Shankar, you spent years at Rallis looking at value chains in Indian agriculture. What are your thoughts on what one can do to help our farmers get more value from agri-chains? Sure. Uh, thanks, Irina. Uh, what I thought I would do is rather than talk about some theoretical aspects, uh, let me share a couple of examples or models where I have been associated with. Uh, I've been running these uh, for many years now. The first one I want to talk about is our pulses experience, experience around pulses. So if I go back, uh, this is many years ago in the Tata group when we sat down and said, what can we do in agriculture, which is good from a nation's point of view, good for farmers, uh, as well as a contribution to agriculture, we zeroed in on pulses. 
the reason being that uh, those days um, we used to import a lot of pulses from countries like Australia and Canada. Uh, they grow pulses only to uh, export it to us and uh, so valuable foreign exchange. But in India, the pulses production was stagnating and a critical source of protein, the maybe most economical source and the per capita usage was steadily coming down over several decades. So we said that let's uh, start an initiative whereby we drive pulses productivity, we add a value to the farmers and help the nation to be more self-reliant on pulses. When we did an estimation actually in Tata strategic management group, we said that 15, 20 years hence, this is going to become a big issue for the nation. To cut a long story short, after a very humble pilot uh, with the state of Tamil Nadu uh, uh, on uh, Uruddal, uh, today uh, we are in uh, Maharashtra, very big public-private partnership program uh, in, in MP and Karnataka. And the whole model was how do we actually work with the farmers, help them to improve yields, quality, uh, as well as optimize the cost, etc. But not stop there, but actually go up the value chain because one of the issues with farmers was finding the right market and price realization, as you mentioned earlier. So in Tata Chemicals, we said that why don't we launch a, a safe as well as nutritious pulses for the consumers and we actually launched a brand and today uh, many of us buy Tata Sampan brand of pulses which is now with Tata Consumer Products. Another example I want to very quickly touch upon which I'm engaged right now in the Center of Sustainable Agriculture and Farm Excellence for the group again. Here, uh, here we start from the consumer. So we've taken a variety, uh, which is a low GI rise and going back all, all the way back to farmers, working for farmer producer organization. And the idea is that not only we drive value at a farm uh, space, how do we unlock value from byproducts as well as from a branding perspective? Very interesting uh, uh, dimensions are coming through and working with farmer producer companies, which I believe is the way forward government is also putting a lot of thrust around that, but a lot of work to be done uh, in, in, in actually making this successful. We know a very small percentage of FPCs today are, are successful, which are led by one or two people. So uh, given that you've given me a very uh, tight time target, if I were to look at from a rural jobs perspective, I can build on this model and uh, share our experience, which has been very energizing. Uh, I would see three elements. Uh, one is on the byproducts processing or even value added products. Uh, we need a lot of skill building and jobs coming there. Second is field skills and administrate, uh, administration skills. How to run FPOs, uh, which, which are mostly Section 8 companies and how do we help them with compliance requirements and administrative skills. Third is around agronomy itself and digital is today by default. How do we help? Uh, digital unfold in agri, mechanization, operators for mechanized agriculture, e-payments and so on. So I would say three dimensions uh, of uh, rural jobs, lots of opportunities possible, but transformation is required. I'll stop here, Irina. I don't know whether I've done well on time, but uh, I can pick <laughs> up on any and build it forward. You Thanks did. a lot. You did very well on time and also on practical insights. Thank you, Shankar. Shashan, shall we move to you? How do you at Development Alternatives see this space? Uh, thank you so much, Irina, uh, co-panelists and everyone listening in for this opportunity. Um, I'd just like to say a few things at the outset. The first is fairly obvious, which is entrepreneurs create jobs. Uh, the second, probably not so, uh, which is that I think, you know, we've been ignoring or have not been paying enough attention to what colleagues and I now call entrepreneurs of hope. Uh, and the reason we do that is that, uh, you know, we found over the years that even the label of micro entrepreneur doesn't work anymore. In fact, two days ago, the government pushed up the definition, you know, of who is a micro entrepreneur uh, even higher. And yet, you know, not just through our work, but in village after village, small town after small town, uh, Uttar Pradesh, Bihar, Madhya Pradesh, Haryana, anywhere we go, uh, we find that, uh, you know, there are people who put in anywhere between, you know, 5,000 rupees to a couple of lakhs, have started up businesses, create three, four, five, seven jobs. 
and it's this category that we're intensely focused on and it's this category that we believe will create jobs you know by the millions uh, we call them entrepreneurs of hope because uh, there are people uh, in mirzapur lakshapati just outside mirzapur uh, young woman who's become an aggregator of vermi compost producers and is responsible almost single handedly for a marketing operation that now employs over 20 people another young lady who runs an ice cream factory uh, she employs 16 people now including the thela walas who go around making ice cream so the numbers can be huge uh, you know it's an average of about five uh, entrepreneurs of hope in every village each creating three or four jobs multiply that across india if you want to buy about 750000 villages and you know you you see we're talking about serious numbers uh, the other thing uh you know more pertinent to the discussion we're having right now uh, on value chains is uh, the whole idea of uh, infusing whatever we're doing with much more by way of social innovation uh, the best definition i'd come across of social innovation was that uh, it's the resolution the creative resolution of apparently conflicting objectives and you know to ends of the spectrum that we see with apparently conflicting objectives uh, the way we see it is you know at one end you have big capital big brands corporations etc wanting to grow and that's a force force that has to be acknowledged you know you can't wish that away and at the other end you have smaller than the micro people who aspire to do things who have the power of entrepreneurship right who can become entrepreneurs you know i i i don't think rural entrepreneurship is all that difficult it's difficult if you don't know how to unleash it right because that spirit exists and how can we bring these together uh, in the uh, example of garments for example uh, if uh, you know if if we're talking about that value chain i don't see uh, you know why things have to necessarily be manufactured in extremely big factories and one message and then you know sent out to the remotest of villages uh, one message that we've been trying to get out to corporations is that instead of shipping products you know kilograms of material they need to ship intelligence uh, so it's become a little bit of a mantra where we're arguing ship knowledge ship products and of course shape those products look and this could be done in value chains such as the agri value chain it becomes even more bizarre you have grains that travel thousands of kilometers to be converted into cereals namkeens and what have you and then they're shipped thousands of kilometers back into the rural economy and that has to change i mean that uh, frankly i mean that's one big opportunity i think or a jolt that's come out of covid-19 which i hope will shake things shake things up uh, and the whole idea is to be inclusive in this you know not to to recognize that everyone in the ecosystem has a role right uh, and uh, we really feel you know that there's immense potential there uh, in terms of what can be done we will have to and you know to close i'd be happy to come back with more details uh, or you know get into a discussion uh, i think we have to go beyond the limits of logical thinking right and uh, you know look at social entrepreneurship uh, micro entrepreneurship uh, entrepreneurs of hope as an entire ecosystem in which we need radical innovation uh, as we go forward mm-hmm. the great thing you know that gives us confidence is that evidence exists right uh, it it can be proven that these things work and we just need to build upon them thank you thank you so much great thank you so much i love the terminology of entrepreneurs of hope others how do you at the world bank see entrepreneurship in rural india um i think again there are uh, multiple views at the world bank um, so it's not a unified view uh, we work uh, both from the angle from a rural development perspective which is a slightly different perspective um uh, then working on the sort of national msme ecosystem uh, uh uh which is a slightly different perspective um and i think sort of uh, um you know sort of i'd like to come in uh, from the overall msme ecosystem perspective um 
I think there's a risk in freezing the question as, uh, you know, what do we do about rural jobs? Uh, and the risk is that it leads us to sort of directed solutions at the last mile, um, uh, uh, you know, in terms of actual incentives to industry and firms to locate somewhere or, or uh, both financial and tax incentives or provision of certain support services in rural areas and so on, um, which, have, which there's evidence actually works, but on the margin that really the structural gaps that are preventing uh, uh, in growth of firms in India overall uh, also apply across both urban and rural areas. And, and without those gaps being addressed uh, uh, in India as a whole, uh, it, it will be more challenging to uh, you know, create jobs and, and, and uh, sustainable employment through, through entrepreneurship. So, you know, I think the question sort of I'd like to sort of ask or I look, I look at it is sort of how do we look at enhancing uh, firm competitiveness and productivity? Uh, in India, uh, uh, you know, 99% of firms have less than 10 employees. Um, unlike in other countries, uh, which has a vibrant private sector, uh, we don't see a correlation between age of the firm uh, uh, and growth. So a firm in India uh, that is five years old and 40 years old we have, has the same number of employees. We're not seeing uh, a kind of sort of cycle. And I think, you know, some of the structural gaps there around business environment, uh, regulatory environment, uh, 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 infrastructure and logistics, uh, are really, you know, if, if we don't address that, uh, then directed solutions and incentives in, in, you know, to have firms create employment in local area uh, are only going to have make a marginal difference uh, on that. Um, you know, very interesting question in the beginning that Anish asked, uh, you know, why don't firms locate in rural areas? Meaning uh, when we see this migrant exodus, uh, you know, bulk of workers are coming from the poorest states in India. So Bihar, rural Bihar, uh, parts of Eastern UP, uh, parts of Odisha. And, and, you know, we, we are seeing big, uh, you know, we can visibly see people moving back. And, and, and it's interesting to ask, uh, you know, why do some of the big textile firms, for example, uh, uh, why are they located in Gurgaon and, and bringing, employ, uh, you know, the labor pool, uh, from far away and all the attendant costs and labor turnover and so on. Would it be more efficient for them to uh, just locate in these places? And in fact, you know, we asked them this question a couple of years ago uh, and the answer was pretty illuminating, right? And some of these big companies, uh, 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 you know, one of the biggest companies, they said, listen, you know, you fix uh, Calcutta port and our costs of exporting out of that port uh, and leave the rest to us. You know, we'll find where in UP and Bihar to locate. Uh, I'm just simplifying it. I mean, there were other issues like the regulatory sort of environment and, and harassment and things. But, you know, they, the firms were flagging that that logistical transport cost issue was the biggest bottleneck to sort of locating in these areas. So I think I say that to make the point that we should be careful that the uh, interventions that are required are structural. And the interventions may not be located in rural areas uh, to enhance rural competitiveness. That's one. Second, there are very sector specific regulatory issues and gaps that hamper competitiveness uh, uh, um, you know, of, of MSMEs, of, of enterprises across the sector. And uh, I'll just give an example of textiles. Uh, in India, there is there are various sort of regulations that hamper import of man-made sort of textile fibers. Uh, and that's the fastest growing sector globally in terms of uh, demand in, in, in all the markets, uh, primary uh, export markets globally. Um, and this is, you know, countries like exporting countries, China, Vietnam, even Bangladesh are seeing very high sort of export growth rates in man-made fibers. But in India, due to the regulatory environment, uh, uh, you know, we have, sort of protectionist measures against, uh, 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 against man-made fibers, which makes it difficult for Indian companies to access 
the best raw materials, uh, man-made fibers being developed globally, specialized fibers. Um, so this just means that around you know 35% of the global market, our firms are not able to compete. And, and textiles, as you know, is one of the large MSME sectors, uh, um, you know, large clusters in places like Tamil Nadu uh, uh, of, of vibrant MSMEs. Um, so, you know, looking, I think my basic point is that, you know, we need to address these structural gaps, uh, these structural com constraints to competitiveness and, and uh, 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 firm growth. Uh, and sort of the rural part of it, uh, directed interventions follows uh, and evidence shows that, that uh, you know, directed interventions like those kinds of incentives um, are, are actually, you know, only effective on the margin. So I'll stop there. What an interesting point, um, Adarsh. Thank you. I think your point saying that a lot of Indian companies are dwarfs and not small is independent of whether it's rural or urban. And it comes from the structural barriers that we've created in our country, whether they're regulatory or otherwise. And uh, what an interesting thought that says that it's not the missing entrepreneurs in rural India. It's the structural barriers we've created, independent of whether it's rural and urban India. Right? <laughs> interesting thought. Jalinder, as Shahi exports, do you does this resonate with you? Is this also what you see? Hey Jalinder, you are on mute, I think. Yeah, good morning to all and thank you for giving the opportunity. It's a very interesting subject. Uh, creating quality rural jobs at scale. Now, when we talk about the scale and the rural jobs, I mean, what are the sectors that come to our mind? Uh, the sectors that come to our mind are, uh, I mean, first is the agriculture itself. I mean, it's the biggest employer in the country. And after that, it is the textile and apparel. This, this is the sector which provides the maximum number of jobs. And the jobs which are given by this sector, textile and apparel, is about 49 million. Out of that apparel, contributes about 13 million jobs. This is the scale that, you know, I mean, this industry, this sector can create. Uh, let me tell a small, uh, this thing, you know, I mean, some, some brief about our company, Shahi Exports. It's a little story kind of a thing. This uh, company was established in 1974 by a very enterprising lady, Mr. Sarla Avja, uh, with very few machines and very few uh, workers, I mean, the tailors. And today, this has grown a biggest company in the uh, country, as far as the apparel sector is concerned, employing 1,20,000 workers in directly on our roll and spread over in nine states. And um, I mean, the, the, the kind of, you know, the exports, it is the highest export, that is what, you know, we are doing. There is a small comparison which was given by um, our ex-VC Nithi Ayo, Mr. Arvind Panagariya, he compared Shahi with Reliance. And he said, uh, Reliance is the household name. Shahi, nobody knows as such because we are exclusively in the international market. <clears throat> and he said the investment made by Reliance in capital in, in assets is about 110 billions. And the employment generated is 250,000 people. Whereas he said, I mean, the study that he made, he said he, Shahi invested in assets to the extent of 185 million, which is a fraction of billion. And the employment given is 106,000 that time, in two years back. And he said, okay, this is the kind of scale that is what is needed. We require more companies like Shahi to come up in India and particularly for giving the employment as such because this is a very, very labor intensive kind of industry. The scale that we here given, if Reliance engages one person for the same kind of investment, Shahi engages 252 workers for the same kind of investment. And I'm coming to the rural side as such, you know, as far as the Shahi is concerned, we have 60 factories in nine states, different different states. Out of that, about 30% of our factories are located in rural areas. And this we have taken the more long time back because 
thinking that, you know, I mean, the, of course, uh, the initially we set up our industry or the units also, uh, the second in the cities and around the cities as such, but subsequently we realized it is better that, you know, we go towards the, uh, the those areas where the workers are available because being labor intensive, the stability and, you know, and the complete, you know, the second engagement and the kind of, you know, retention of the workers is very, very important. So that is how, you know, we started moving from urban areas to the rural areas. And today about 30, 30 percent, you know, our units are located in rural areas also, and the experience is very good. Now, this is the industry which attracts a lot of workers from different, different states. I mean, basically the migrant workers, you know, they come from Bihar, they come from Odisha, they come from Jharkhand. And um, I mean, the, they say when they come, they stay you know, with us you know, for some time. And the addressing attrition is the biggest problem that we are facing. I mean, every month we have almost, you know, seven to eight percent attrition because these are the angles. Basically, I mean, 70 percent of our workers are in the female workers. So we come from different, different states, different, different locations, different uh, remote places. They come, they stay for some time and thereafter they want to go back, you know, and settle in the uh, life and all that. So that's the reason that, you know, I mean, the lot of attrition is there in this particular uh, uh, industry. So to uh, the second, I mean, the, there are four factors why this attrition happens you now. One is that, you know, they are away from the families. The second one, their food habits are different, you know, when they come to the city, their food habits are different. Then they miss their friends also. They, they are also not sure what is going to be the future as such. Because of this four F, that is the family, food, friends, and future. Because of that, you know, the attrition is very, very high and they go back to their villages as such. You know. There is also, I, th I think, let me also touch upon a uh, very interesting kind of phenomena. There's always a tussle between capital, this is the financial capital, and the human capital as such. The initially, I mean, the financial capital was centered around the cities and the metropolitan cities and not around. This created a lot of you know, issues for the cities as well as, and the migration was, you know, I mean, evident as such, you know. But now this with this COVID-19 has shown that this is not a good model as such, you know. The factories will have to go back to the villages where the workers are available, where the human capital is available. And this is what I think the path which is shown by this COVID-19, I think we have to um, adopt you know, this kind of a path. And this being the this thing, I think, low investment and highly labor intensive, this industry can go to any place and can really do it. Of course, you know, there are certain issues which are there with, with the local government. If you can, you know, I mean, collaborate with them, those issues can be sorted out. Basically, my suggestion, you know, for taking this industry uh, to the rural area and giving the employment at scale and particularly to the female workers as such from the very humble background, it, this doesn't require, you know, very kind of, you know, highly uh, educated persons, even the illiterate can also, you know, find jobs in this particular industry. So what is needed, you know, for attracting this industry is that you know, some of the state governments, they have already come out with the various kinds of incentive schemes, like, you know, uh, Jharkhand government, and they are giving, you know, 5,000 rupees to 6,000 rupees for a worker uh, for a period of you know, seven uh, years. I mean, this in per month, they will be giving that much kind of wage uh, subsidy kind of a thing. Other governments, so they are also following similar kind of a thing, you know. This is one attraction. Second attraction would be, I mean, you know, if you talk about the Bangladesh, you know, Bangladesh, you know, the, uh, the um, kind of corporate tax, which is about, you know, 12%. Here, of course, the corporate tax is very, very high. But if the industry wants to go to the rural area, I think, you know, maybe the government can think of, you know, having some sort of relaxation and similar kind of incentive in the corporate tax also, if they can give one, I think industry will definitely go there and this will be a win-win situation because already this kind of facility is given to the industries which are set up in SEZ, special economic zones. So why not, you know, treat this also when you are going to the rural area and creating employment, I mean, those facilities also could be given to them. I think this industry can transform the complete landscape of our country and this can become a good uh, engine of growth for the rural economy as such. So I think um, maybe that when we discuss further, I'll be coming back on this. Great. Thank you, Jalandhar. I'm sure you also want the government to focus on the rupee.
and on getting you the right FTAs because that's what Bangladesh and Vietnam have. But yeah. very, very interesting points, Sanjeev. Can I ask you to help us think through this from the lens of retail and the value chains that you've seen in the past and now in IFAM? Uh, good morning. And uh, let me just uh, quickly pick up from the uh, both my experiences at uh, Cargill and Reliance. And then what we're doing now, uh, I mean, in another capacity other than iFarms. So basically, as I see the rural India, there are two big things which are very clear. One is the agriculture sector as such and the supply chains uh, sort of what emanate from there. And the second is a non-farm um, element of the business, which is pretty large as well. In fact, in, as a rural GDP structure, there's a fairly large component of non-farm areas. I'm going to focus my thoughts entirely on agriculture as to how the supply chains uh, could have an impact, uh, how they could uh, uh, you know, drive this change. Uh, two things come to mind and uh, that where is the biggest opportunity? So nearly you know, three fourths of ag GDP now is uh, uh, focused towards the high value agriculture like uh, you know, horticulture value chains, uh, dairy supplies, organic, medicinal plants, honey, and these are, there are, there's a unique benefit in all these areas that uh, the employment intensity is nearly four times more than the traditional cereal farming. And the need for processing is significantly higher than a very typical uh, sort of cereal and, uh, you know, pulses farming, et cetera. So there's a both a need for, uh, you know, the managerial inputs, the manage uh, the capital and the technology, all of them are required. The problem India has faced uh, always is that the, somebody mentioned the word near farm, which is extremely important, that uh, the exchange of money at the near farm area is the most important element which can galvanize the rural economy. And uh, that is where I find the fundamental problem in the India's uh, whole ecosystem, that uh, every time a production is done, so you may have a high production, but if it tends to you know, go to the urban uh, centers for sale, uh, which is where the demand lies, uh, then what's happening is that really the cash is getting exchanged in the urban area, so the employment gets generated there. There's very little happening at the near farm level. The second issue which uh, typically all these uh, segments have faced over the years is that uh, because of very little capitalization of agriculture processing at the near farm level, the uh, efforts have been at best sporadic. So we have FPOs, you know, we have some six, 7,000 FPOs, another 10,000 are being set up. But uh, really, if you look at the ground level track record of these FPOs, so in theory, they're good, but uh, in practice, extremely difficult because, you know, the talent to run them, to manage the capital and whole gamut of activities which tend to come with an organization uh, is always an issue uh, in these systems. If you look at the uh, self-help groups, I mean, multiple other collectives like cooperatives, etc. So that basically remains a continuous challenge. So I've got basically three uh, sort of uh, propositions uh, for this panel as to how the government could look at it very differently. And uh, anything in agriculture when we talk is always linked to uh, policy is the core part of it. And really that um, I would like to address that. So we did a study a uh, little earlier, a couple of uh, uh, months back. And uh, in nearly seven ministries, there are 126 odd uh, subsidy schemes of supporting the agriculture. So I think the first suggestion I would have, uh, you know, for the government, and obviously there's a lot of rush to you know, support the uh, ag and the various other elements in the economy, is that how do we consolidate, reorganize and calibrate or rebalance our whole support to the agriculture, that the money that is being, uh, uh, that's being spent is well spent. Uh, it is being targeted. Uh, the capital is going into the right uh, set of areas against a well honed practical uh, practitioners, you know, who, um, uh, who can see exactly the, how these value chains might work. So that is one part which my submission is that government already supports in multiple different ways, almost nearly three lakh crores of uh, support each year with the additionality of, uh, you know, support in financial uh, schemes, etc. I think that is one part which I think uh, uh, people have to get together, all the stakeholders really, in terms of working alongside. The second issue is, which I fundamentally in another capacity as, uh, you know, the in Agriculture Skill Council, is what I see is that uh, the missing element in all this. So in terms, if you look at the entrepreneurial talent, if you look at the, uh, the capacity to innovate, create, uh, the ability to, 
you know, to be resilient in terms of fighting out the challenges, uh, you know, what, and all of them are demonstrating that. But I would really say that 70% uh, of India, which is, uh, you know, residing in the rural area, so at a micro level, at an operational decision point as to, you know, whether I spend this five rupees or not, is they're good at. But structurally to build up uh, anything of substance, whether, in a, you know, they are themselves or they're hiring one person, or uh, they want to build up an enterprise of five or seven people, I think that capacity is woefully inadequate and for three reasons. So one, that uh, they don't have the capital and the means to sustain an organization or even work towards it. Uh, they don't have the, uh, the regulations are not supportive at all. So either you have no regulations or there's too much of regulation, the challenges around that. But the biggest piece is that they lack the skills to drive it. And I think there should be a massive effort in terms of really reorganizing these skills or bringing a very practical perspective as to how, whether you have to, uh, you know, process pulses at the farm gate level, or, uh, you know, you have to set up a horticulture uh, operation of very, uh, very insignificant size also, it does not matter. But, uh, you know, simple act of sorting and grading and, you know, putting the understanding quality or understanding the, how the money sort of moves and understanding a very little bit of accounting, et cetera. I think that is where we need a lot of innovation, which has to uh, drive this growth of jobs in the rural economy. And uh, I think that is where the massive effort on skilling on practical side of it, not just, uh, 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 you know, sort of working towards, uh, towards simply doing some classroom or theoretical work. So there's a tremendous amount of work which is happening in the skill ecosystem, so which is very positive development of last couple of years. And I think um, that needs to be further galvanized that uh, how do we build up a collaborative structures, you know, between, uh, between not-for-profits, between which are active on the ground level, uh, the private sector, you know, which is both spending uh, mega money on, uh, you know, the CSR funding and even the smaller enterprises, which have got a genuine stake in, you know, building those value chains. And I think this urban rural sort of uh, uh, collaboration, I think is extremely important that uh, how it evolves in terms of, you know, the skill development to genuinely connect supply to the demand side. And I think the day we sort of do that effectively, it can make a big difference. And the, my last point is that, uh, and I think uh, you mentioned that Irina in the beginning, is that women are such a critical component of the entire, uh, entire uh, system as we run in the country. And I think that's where I find the big issue is that, uh, I mean, part of the regulations, and I don't want to belabor that point too much, is that uh, women have become absolutely core and germane to the entire entrepreneurship in the high value agriculture. So whether we look at horticulture, Culture, whether we look at dairy as a segment, whether we look at, uh, uh, you know, the, any of the areas in which the farmers are, um, uh, are active, women are playing absolutely critical role in the whole process. And yet we find that, uh, uh, you know, how to sort of mainstream their effort, how to uh, sort of, uh, you know, build up a structure where they're able to contribute effectively and not just contribute effectively, but be able to be the managers of their own enterprise. Because as the experience on the self-help group shows that uh, their ability to self-organize themselves be disciplined borrowers and uh, more importantly be being a extremely disciplined and ethical uh, payback uh, uh, people in terms of the so, the, uh, so that you know the NPAs and all that are much much lesser uh, so to summarize at three levels I'm suggesting a focus on high value agriculture which is around largely around horticulture medicinal organic beekeeping etc which are both technology capital and management uh, requirement focus in a big ticket way on uh, skill development to truly bring these enterprises to, uh, closer to the market and they rather than dependent purely on subsidy and support all the time and uh, or a large corporate or otherwise they are genuinely integrating themselves into the value chain so they can effectively create cash economy at the ground level and uh, last but not the least i think look at uh, the whole policy framework that how do we uh, our resources aren't that large how do we put our resources together and uh, make schemes and policy in a manner that which can genuinely create those enterprises and then use all the returning migrant labor or the farm uh, hands uh, to build up enterprises and really make the rural economy vibrant. So I'll stop here and uh, we can pick more questions later. Thank you. Thank you, Sanjeev. Very, very interesting. And last, please, Prithvi, Rupakov, what are your thoughts to help us close off on the panel discussion? Yeah. Thanks, uh, thanks, Irina. Thanks, everyone, for giving this opportunity. 
uh, actually uh, we are working in this staples category and uh, our thought is that uh, in this staples post harvest processing and packaging is a huge opportunity which can generate the rural jobs uh, today already there are efforts being made by you know uh, setting up lot of fpos or everything else but that has not been successful uh ma majorly and the reason around it is i see there are three major impediments why they are not being successful the number one is that free flow of uh, you know agriculture sector is not yet liberalized if you see staples category naturally the production centers are you know uh, nationalized supply chain is nationalized for example what i mean, what do i mean to say is for example urad is being produced it will be produced mainly in say western rajasthan or we if we talk about it it's a production centers are say in mp so this is true for all its staple category that it's a production centers are national not local it means the supply chain has to be national uh, if for entire country wheat is produced in mp or part of you know gujarat or rajasthan you can't take that to tamil nadu because of geography you know uh, geological condition so the production will always remain you know centered around some center but supply chain has to be national it means it has to liberalize so movement becomes free so that is the one challenge that why the demand has not been democratized because of that so if demand is not democratized it is not accessible easily actionable way to the small fpos and agripreneurs of course uh, there is you know the challenge to that the second thing which i see impediment is infrastructure and uh, capital availability and that's where i see lot of you know enablers are today supporting government is supporting that lot of you know organizations like world bank nabard lot of you know tri many ngos are working to that however we are also as we are actually demand side we are you know uh, we are present in mumbai and uh, serve around 16000 small stores restaurants and they and we prefer across the country so when we our experience says that even that infrastructure which is being created you know uh, it has to be such that the competitiveness of uh, you know these small SP, these fpos or everything you know remain there when i say competitiveness means uh, what you are producing to that infrastructure should be uh, you know as good as uh, you know a, a big mill which is giving the product so you can't compromise on the quality of the product but still there is lot of good work being done here and i think uh, that work you know uh, needs to continue to do that so that you know it will help to do but what is third critical set, uh, you know element which is completely missing and which is why in this people category fpo and agripreneur has not been successful is you know understanding of the demand parameters and availability of actionable demand at the ground when i say demand parameters for example what should be the right packaging what should be you know the grid and i i our experience says for example you know uh, like fpos who are working in this segment they treat the same way consumption pulses or whatever staples for consumption same way as for tea production they are two entirely different things you know uh, and the costing is entirely different economics is entirely different so what our suggestion and experience is what we work is that the model which is you know to how should it be you know working uh, first thing is liberalization of the entire movement which is in the fresh is has happening and therefore fpos are more successful in the fresh category the second thing which is important is you know there should be all the and uh, these enabler organization and people knows when they work together the third element should also come is the demand player should be there in that so when you are with the demand player and you know the right input goes that what parameter i need the product and if i need then demand player's role is to ensure that he will take care of you know the demand part and whatever intervention they will suggest it means they will procure from that and that is good for all the three all because it will simplify the supply chain today supply chain is so much of you know uh, people between it is produced and it's simple is a category which is produced once in a year but but consumed throughout year it means somebody will have to store it somebody will have to there would be product carrying cost there would be you know uh, uh, the processing and everything will be there which means so many jobs will be created and we should look at the taluka level these things so and the demand player should be there more demand player it is better but there should be broad spectrum demand player also should be there when i say broad spectrum they help to set the unit economics right and make the entire is fpo or agripreneur unit more competitive for example our experience is when we are procuring cashew you know we don't only procure very high good grade one cashew w40 but when 
these fpos process there would be you know the different three four grades will come out it's not only one grade they can sell one grade to any best player but what will they will do with the entire basket of the grade there is a, there is you know brokens will come out so we help them where to sell it or we procure and sell to our customers you know so so i think this is the model which will work and i think it will really you know uh, make this happen and See the scale of this is immense. Why? Because naturally, India is in the staple production geographically. India is blessed with that. Every geographical region has some unique staple coming, which means rice, pulses variety, or wheat, or spices, or dry food. You know, so it means every taluka level can be unique. Product product is anyway unique, which is given by the nature. You know, it is. It can be brought to the taluka level, and if it is processed in such a way where demand. Player enabler regulations as you know support these entrepreneurs and SPOs uh, definitely can you know generate lot of jobs. I can give you simple example that today India has 5,500 talukas. If we are able to create 10 you know entrepreneur or SPO units in one taluka and each employ 10 people, it just simply creates five lakh you know jobs immediately. And each providing such a unique product and food is such a thing where. Consumer is also moving in the direction where they need stressed people, you know, where they need that. Okay, where it is coming, which farm it is coming. So it is, it is such that consumer behavior doesn't support scale, but consumer behavior says if you give me more localized, though I understand, for example, some people is coming from distant part of say any state, but can you tell me where locally it is coming? You know, okay. so notion is local. so i think that is the way is the right way to create that and uh, i think my thoughts are that thank you prithvi very very interesting and to close us today folks we have uh, shrini ayer from ford foundation shrini help us close this uh, conversation yeah thanks irene thanks uh, uh, at ford we are particularly interested uh, in working with uh, marginalized communities you know and regions which are typically invisible and within that therefore i thought i'd speak about non timber forest produce that very often gets missed out in discussions and uh, we probably are not adequately aware of the immense role that it can play you know for for example we are the world's largest producer of lac and yet we do not have a single product line a paint line in india which which is based on lac similarly lac is also used for uh, enteric capsules for for coating etc similarly we are also the world's largest producer of sal seed and sal seed oil is is a close replacement to cocoa butter and yet none of our uh, co- you know chocolate manufacturers turn to sal seed so uh, i'm just pointing out uh, similarly if you look at tasar and the very limited consumption of tasar for example in home furnishings even though it has phenomenal properties it make it very attractive as a material for home furnishings i mean this is just indicative of of the immense demand that exists for non timber forest produce be it industrial as i just mentioned it could even be cultural as we as a nation start shifting from plastic and thermocol in our in our temples to perhaps leaf plates and medicinal uses as we get more and more conscious now uh, while there is immense demand it's also something that's phenomenally potential for our topic because as somebody else said it has it has a, a very very strong local multiplier because it's uh, no i mean it's uh, the, the collection is virtually sort of cash and put free so everything that the process uh, the producers or the collectors receive would be by way of 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 money which gets circulated locally and also the first few steps in processing are very typically labor intensive and yet uh, the ntfp based processing is very very limited we have uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, you know we have uh, almost sort of fabulous uh, details about how there are large uh, large sort of swathes of indian forests which do not have even a single processing unit now why that is not happening there are several reasons but let me at least uh, mention three because i'm i'm sticking to the 3 minute uh, uh, limit one is 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 first of all uh, as a nation we need credible information i mean it's uh, we all know that that information on lack markets which is uh, quantities qualities and prices are typically uh, uh, controlled by traders and they have an interest in in manipulating data 
similarly, we have that for other uh, NTFE commodities which have local oligopolies. And therefore, this uh, should be a public good if we want to create competitive investor interest in these uh, in these sectors. And therefore, we need uh, the state. Uh, uh, to, to invest deeply in credible information on volumes related to NTFPs, as indeed uh, was the investment on, on, on agri-commodities or weather or wherever. You know, the, the, these are public good uh, nature and therefore it's best that the state invests. There's been very little effort in the past on that. The second is, is widespread support to stabilize and increase uh, the volumes that are produced or collected. I mean, because it is natural resource space, there are uh, there, there's volatility across years. However, uh, and Ford has supported several initiatives across the country. With some investment, it's possible to both stabilize and increase local production and collection, and that offers a stable base uh, for, for for investors to come in and and invest uh, sort of uh, bricks and mortar in 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 processing units. And the third, uh, and this would also include, therefore, securing rights of the collectors to harvest non-timber forest produce. We as a country have moved towards community forestry resources, which is a very good move. And that needs to be uh, sort of further uh, advanced so that uh, forest dependent communities feel secure that they can collect these, uh, the, the, these uh, NTFPs. And, and finally, we actually need a bit uh, of what our World Bank uh, colleague said, we need a bit of ease of doing business at the level of the block or the district. So whether it's in terms of land acquisition locally, whether it's in terms of uninterrupted power supply, credit, and even if we are looking at sort of uh, water and sewerage and movement of goods, uh, you know, in all of these, uh, we, we, we need a far greater advancement on the ease of doing business. That's not difficult. It just needs a certain amount of political will. So if we take these three steps, I believe we can have uh, uh, a much greater, not really share of overall NTFPs processed very close to where they're collected, but also an expanded volume of NTFP processing. And in, and in turn, that could feed what I believe is, is, is immense potential demand. And the consequences for the rural poor, particularly tribals and other forest dependent communities, is that they get higher incomes as well as a higher share of the value of NTFPs. And in turn, that could generate a, multiply, a multiplier impact in terms of demand, particularly through rural construction. We've had a period in the recent past where there was a significant boost to rural construction, largely housing construction, because there was a, you know, a certain increase in, in, in NREG incomes as well as farm incomes. So now if, if, if forest dependent communities also get a boost in income, we believe that could also, in a sense, uh, uh, activate the rural economy and in turn further create jobs. Stop here. Hey, Shreenin, thank you so much for that. So folks, there we are. Um, that's the panel discussion for you. And as I close out, let me just share with you two thoughts that have always struck me when I've looked at rural India. One is um, the, um, the way we classify it. I mean, if you look at rural India, it is Sham Benegal's rural India, but it's also 50% of India's richest people. It's also uh, a place that can be as competitive as uh, any other place in India. It's also a huge market. It's also a, few, uh, a series of human capital. So one of the thoughts that has always struck me is that in a country and a culture which is as old as ancient as India, we are actually a very young economic system. And in this economic system, we always think of rural India as that poor rural India. When I actually think, you know, it's a very vibrant uh, economy with a huge opportunity for growth, not just as a market, but also as a source of production. So one is, can we re-imagine uh, the lens we, with which we think of rural India and don't just think of it as these poor people who have to be subsidized and helped up and don't just think of it as a political entity where the votes lie and which has to be managed every five years, but to think of it as a potential vibrant economic entity. And the moment you do that, I think what the panel shared with you was their thoughts, which said, you know what, in many ways, it's not different from any economic entity anywhere in India or anywhere else in the world. There are opportunities today which need to be scaled up. And for that, we need organization capacity of entrepreneurs, of leaders, of organization forms. We need more capital. We need risk management. There are entities there which can get scaled up, provided the market linkages are made better. And again, that's about 
infrastructure, it's about information flow, it's about risk management. And then most importantly, there are a whole bunch of entities that can be born if we make rural India, like urban India, more competitive. Now that competitiveness could come from better infrastructure, it could come from access to cheaper capital, it could come from the Indian government thinking about FPAs and about the, the rupee dollar conversion rate. But you know what, in many ways, not very different from what is needed to make uh, urban companies more attractive. So I love this debate about rural economy. The only thought that I would leave with, with you with is, it's not an area that needs support and sympathy. It's not an area that needs subsidy. It's a very vibrant part of India that needs uh, to be made economically viable. And that requires investment, that requires right policies, it requires market linkages. And like every other place in India, it requires modern technology and manufacturing and uh, management systems so that we can scale it up well. But let's hand it over to John. Uh, and before I do that, thank you so much to the panelists for your thoughts. And now John will uh, share with you questions that have come. Some of them might be directed directly to you and the others we will leave it open to the panel. Thanks, Irina. Uh, it's a wonderful discussion. We've got some great questions, actually, very uh, beautifully crafted, uh, very relevant questions. Um, I'll take the first one to uh, Mr. Patra. Um, it, the question, uh, as I read it out, is the continued questioning is eating away the desire of micro-entrepreneurs to step out of their comfort. They might go for daughter industries in uh, to distribute the turnover rather than break the ceiling. Uh, I request uh, Mr. Patra to comment. Um, so largely, how do we get uh, small scale industries to break the scale ceiling to promote um, rural jobs? Uh, thank, thank you for that question, uh, whoever sent it in. Uh, it, it's an extremely relevant question and I think it's something that not only I touched upon but probably several other speakers touched upon when they talked about capacity and you know, or, or rather the lack of capacity and how do we deal with it. In uh, her remarks a minute ago, Irina talked about the perception that we have of you know people not being able to do things. Uh, the straightforward uh, you, you know answer or you know approach we follow is not to cushion, right? Uh, in fact, uh, that's probably one of the worst things you can do, and it's uh, something that happens a lot in schemes. Uh, you know, any kind of enterprise development scheme, training programs, etc., that uh, uh, are introduced uh, for entrepreneurs. Uh, they, 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 you, you need to, uh, you know, unleash uh, a, a culture of entrepreneurship, and you can't do that by spoon feeding. So, uh, don't cushion uh, is my, uh, you know, response to that. Uh, you know, for people to stand up, be counted, break the glass ceiling, wherever that ceiling is set, and I don't quite understand, you know, what the phrase daughter enterprises means, but it, it, it is, you know, it, it is a question of capacity building empowerment. Part of that is perception. We perceive that people don't have the capacity, but part of it is reality, right? And, uh, you know, I think Mr. Astana pointed out quite rightly that that's an area that you need to work on, uh, which is, you know, something I think any right-minded organization is investing in. But there's another aspect, you know, it's uh, performance is not just about individual capacities. Performance is also about systemic conditions, you know, or the ability to do something is about systemic conditions. And that's where I think uh, our organization and a few others have been paying a lot of attention. Just to give you one example, uh, at the district level in uh, uh, Haridwar, uh, rather Roorkee in Mirzapur, Badoi, three districts of Bundelkhand, uh, uh, the NCR region, Palwal, what we've done is we've created multi-stakeholder entrepreneurship coalitions. And, you know, there isn't time to go into this in detail, but what we've done is we've created a collaborative structure where people from all kinds of different departments, entrepreneurs themselves, uh, who would otherwise be working in silos, uh, actually get together. And, you know, they're sort of, putting resources onto the table, which make it much more easier, much more possible for aspiring entrepreneurs to set up businesses. And at a very low cost, uh, mind you, this is just the cost of a little bit of facilitation. In fact, our more mature coalitions are now, you know, they, they sort of have their own momentum. 
similarly, uh, using the network of uh, common service centers, uh, we have entrepreneurship information kiosks, a growing network, right? So it's a question of, you know, creating the kind of institutional architecture or institutional infrastructure that can do, uh, you know, many, if not all of the kinds of things, uh, uh, the solutions that our uh, panelists have been talking about. Uh, and it's at that systemic level where I think inroads can be made uh, with remarkable results. Thank you. Um, thanks for that. Uh, I have another question directed to Anish. Um, uh, the question reads, uh, given the fact that a majority of farmers are net food buyers, would there be an opportunity to create food processing units at the farm gate level itself? Do you want to take that? Sure. And in some ways, uh, you know, they are, uh, so PDS is uh, one bit of it and it is supplying. The Sanjeev's point that uh, HVA is an opportunity is the route to take. And uh, the route to take is to get this produce in the hands of uh, consumers who have better paying uh, capacity. You know, one uh, conversation we always have in context of dairy is share in the consumer uh, rupee. And you just look at the other segments. You look at uh, cereals, you look at uh, fruit and vegetables, you will see the way dairy has uh, made it possible for increased share of farmer in consumer rupee, we haven't been able to do with other value chains. And that's where, and that includes uh, what Srini was saying with forest, uh, which is minimal, you know, as a, as a collector, and you no, do not even, you know, factor in the ways that goes in picking it up. So there is an opportunity as uh, net buyers, and in some places, if you look at the NFSA, in the NFSA Act, they had provided for local procurement and local distribution locally. Some efforts has happened. I think in, in uh, Madhya Pradesh, they did uh, come up with some guideline where they said that local procurement of uh, millets uh, rice and uh, could happen and could be distributed through within the district it could happen the other point i would like to and you know pick here uh, john is uh, many of us uh, uh, during the conversation alluded to the uh, the institutional framework in the villages with uh, women collectives uh, coming in and fpos and fpos we know are of all shapes and sizes some of them uh, are uh, yeah, ready to engage with the market. Some of them are, as you would say, sub subsistence uh, you know, engagement. So, but still look at just the numbers, the 65 million women organized across the country. And it, they have been you know, aggregating uh, individual members uh, into various collectives of the village and at the cluster level. This power of this collectivization sometime back was used by Hindustan uh, Lever to create uh, a market to consumer connect through something like uh, Shakti Amma and many others. And I know we have looked at insurance products uh, going through that uh, uh, pipeline. The, uh, the uh, you know, interesting opportunity now exists. And again, some uh, state rural agriculture missions are trying that out is getting produced to markets. And one has started looking at the cluster level federations where you have about 3,500, uh, 4,000 women to come together and produce various goods uh, with, you have seen this across the country now with masks, PP, and there is again an opportunity, stitching of opportunity and, you know, in that segment. And uh, Giri Saab talked about that and one could then multiply it there. So there, uh, one thought I had, this would need skills, capital, technology, and business models. There would, uh, you know, by itself, the SHGs and the rural livelihood missions would not suffice. We need uh, corporate partnerships to infuse some of this, the skills, tech, and the business models. Without that, the power of aggregation and all with the, the point that uh, Sanjeev, you made on the ethical uh, you know, participation of the members, you know, will come unstuck if you do not bring in you know, better technology, better business models for them to come together. And that's a, a big opportunity. Thanks, John. Thanks, Anish. Uh, we have about uh, 10 minutes left. Um, just a time check. Um, I have the next question from, uh, from two people. I'll try and combine them. Uh, one is, uh, can we compare rural and urban entrepreneurship uh, considering the limited access to entrepreneurship resources, basic infrastructure, and lack of access to information, how fair is it to see them with the same lens? 
Uh, the second question is actually directed to Shrashtant. I'll open it to the rest of the panelists as well. Uh, how do we make sense of uh, ease of business at a district level because of uh, fragmentation? Uh, um, so one is directed to Shrashtant, but I'll open the broad question to the panelists uh, to answer. Should should I should I just attempt a quick answer to that? Is the sure. ease of business route? Yeah, and I'm I'm really sorry. I don't want to you know speak for too long. Uh, it, it's it, it's more or less what I was talking about earlier, uh, but bears repetition, which is that the resources exist, and instead of you know a directed uh, scheme based kind of approach, uh, and I'm using, you know, scheme as sort of code language because it's not just about the government. Uh, I think when uh, private corporations try to make their supply chains more inclusive, it's also, you know, a, an extremely vertical arrangement. And instead of, you know, those kind of vertical arrangements, uh, any system scientist, uh, you know, who's looking at this problem and its complexity uh, will tell you that you need to look at horizontal arrangements. Uh, at if not the village level, but uh, you know maybe the block or the district level, because the resources exist there to make businesses, to make uh, it much easier for people to do business. And the innovation lies in you know rejigging uh, uh, how how people are able to work together, uh, because if you know you can get that to happen, uh, then much more is possible uh, than what's happening right now by way of uh, entrepreneurship and consequent job creation. Stop there. Thanks. Thank you, Shastan. Does anyone else want to take a shot at the same question? Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, there's really yeah. here. Uh, yeah. it's, uh, it's a combination of, of, of two different strategies. One is, uh, yeah, are the horizontal strategies of, of, uh, you know, of ease of doing business, which, uh, uh, you know, which is broadly referred to internal deregulation, etc. Uh, while retaining safeguards, particularly environmental and labor safeguards, we, we also need to, but that's just necessary, but not sufficient. We also need some vertical, uh, <clears throat> uh, you know, the thing which actually, in a sense, try and tilt, uh, tilt uh, you know, the, the, the ways of doing business for specific resources given local endowments. So you need a bit of both. We've had experience in the country in the 80s uh, at the district level. In fact, there were several districts in India and the National you know, uh, Commission on Development of Backward Areas, industrial estates, mixed uh, results, I would say, but at least we can learn from where it went well and where it didn't uh, go well. And we need to push that, maybe descale it by one tenth or one twentieth, and even try and look at sort of block level clusters of, of facilities because you need to spur that thing up. Uh, yeah, sure. Shankar here. Uh, can I take a go at it? Yes, please. Uh, right. On the ease of doing business, uh, uh, typically we talk about regulations and ease of regulations. So I would really like to comment upon while ease of regulations is, of course, essential. Uh, there is another layer to it, which is a very, very high degree of change management or even mindset management. Let me take the example of uh, the core problem in agriculture today. Gone are the days when we are talking about uh, how can we produce more and uh, it, it's a production driven agriculture. Today, the markets are very sensitive. Consumer awareness is on a high and therefore more and more agriculture needs to be attuned towards what the market needs. If you look at wellness foods, uh, nutritious foods, those counters are increasing. People are becoming more and more ab aware about safe food and in fact, uh, perhaps even willing to pay premium for that. And therefore, the whole thing is shifting towards market orientation. And today, a big problem faced by the farmers is more on market realization. And how do I get not only the reasonable market realization, but stable market realization. So uh, we have paid uh, even uh, uh, 200 rupees a kilo for our favorite pulse or 100 rupees a kilo for tomatoes. At the same time, there are times when milk is thrown on the road, tomatoes are not harvested, and therefore this wide fluctuation in realization is a big issue. Therefore, coming back to the uh, regulations, 
uh, while regulations are getting eased uh, uh, slowly, whether we are talking about uh, uh, contract farming or we are talking about APMC regulations or even Essential Commodities Act, um, when we look at, uh, for example, marketeers boldly coming forward and tying up with farmers, they need the comfort that if a particular price is agreed, if the yield actually happens in the field, all that will come at that particular price. Uh, at the same time, uh, the farmers also need assurance that the marketeers will step in and actually buy it at the uh, contracted price and not take advantage of the market movements. I think uh, the way contract uh, farming regulations are done, more importantly, mindset change and implemented is very, very important. Similarly, when we are talking about marketeers buying directly, uh, stocking norms uh, and limitations on stocking, etc., needs a very different purview and uh, uh, free flow of the markets. Uh, I would also talk about uh, in, in the same ease of doing business, there are a lot of government schemes. In fact, uh, we can't complain there aren't enough uh, in the areas of finance and insurance. But today, talk to a farmer, the trust level of you want to take an insurance policy, will I ever get a claim, is very, very poor. Uh, I would even put it as negative. Uh, similarly, there are so many finance uh, schemes available, so many uh, government uh, uh, credit lines opened up, uh, even what you have heard in the last couple of days. But the ease of availability of finance and insurance schemes, the skill of taking it to the uh, farmer and making it happen uh, at, at a field level, and uh, the, the smoothness with which the whole thing is dispersed is really the uh, thing to be done. So. While frameworks are getting unfolded, I think the ease of execution is, is also a big issue. Thanks. Great. Thank you. I just want to uh, uh, take uh, one really popular question supported by a lot of people. Um, how do we reimagine the post COVID-19 world and create a uh, radical transformation? And especially uh, how do we uh, not allow ourselves to conform to existing gender roles? and uh, limit uh, women in traditional uh, jobs uh, and roles. Um, and uh, so that seems to be a, a popular question. And a similar question is uh, how, um, you know, how can we move from informal to formal uh, in rural areas when it comes to uh, jobs and the role of women uh, in workforce in rural areas? Can I come uh, in? Over to the entire panel, yeah. Yeah, can I come in? I'm Giri. Yes. Yes. Uh, this is a very interesting question, uh, how we are going to cope, you know, after this uh, COVID-19 as such, you know, we are seeing exodus of, you know, workers, their families having, you know, loads of things on their head and on bags, and uh, they are moving towards their villages, you know, of course, it is a very natural kind of a thing when such kind of, you know, uh, pandemic uh, situation is there, you know, everybody wants to be uh, nearer to their families or in you know, their homes. This is but natural. Now, so far, there has been, as I said earlier, so far there has been, I mean, the uh, plight of the people coming from rural areas to urban areas you know, in search of livelihood as such. But now, situation has changed. People want to be there in their villages or you know, to their near and dear ones. So naturally, the industry also will have to think, whatever the industry can think of, you know, moving towards the rural areas, this is what we need to do. And particularly, I remember there was uh, some survey done sometime back, and there are 33 crores of women who are in the age of the, uh, the second employable age as such. And these, this is the silent power that, you know, rural India is having, and we are not tapping on this, you know, power as such. And one of the economists, you know, had rightly predicted, if we tap this rural silent power, female power, that our GDP can grow by 27%. This is the kind of a potential that we have. And we have not realized that potential. Now, this is the time COVID-19 has given the opportunity to realize that one. So this is now, and now it is a time that you know, we have to go back to the villages. The, actually, the progress or the kind of, you know, thing what we want is in the villages. Only thing is that, you know, we need to create that kind of infrastructure over there. 
Now, why people are reluctant to go to the villages because you know you don't have uh, those facilities which they enjoy in the the thing. You don't have the good schools. You don't have the health good health facilities. You don't have the infrastructure as such. That is why you try to concentrate only in the urban areas as such. But if this kind of a facility is given, there will be definitely lot of people want to do business. And if when we talk about the ease of doing business, of course this has got to be taken, you know, in the right spirit. The people or the agencies or the NGOs who are engaged in this particular thing, they have to really, you know, step in, guide the people, make the people understand. And at every stage, they will have to handhold them till the time they come up to a particular level. I think this is the time that to transform our rural India and make them part of the big picture as such. This is what I feel about you know this. Thank you, just a moment. Thank you so can, much for that. Can I come in? Uh, uh, we just uh, have. I'm really sorry about this. We we are at 11:30. We would love to take your comments on this um, because the next uh, panelist is waiting. I hope you don't mind. Uh, I would just want uh, uh, Irina uh, to uh, give her last closing comments. Um, I'm really sorry. Uh, we just run out of time. Uh, we just want to keep a time check. But it's a great discussion. I just want to uh, thank thank Anish for putting this panel together and for each of the panelists for being here and sharing their. Amazingly interesting thoughts. Those of you listening in, don't get worried if we some contradicted ourselves. This is a huge elephant, and all of us were touching the part of the elephant that is closest to us and the one we understand the most. So thank you so much for being there. Yeah. I wish um, all of us stop thinking of rural India as rural and thought of it just as India, and then we'd be fine. Thank you so much, John, for organizing this. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. And that's Thank Irina, a former partner at McKinsey and co-advisor to several leading organizations across the world. Thank you, the panelists, for joining us. Uh, it was a great conversation. And what a last question uh, leading up to our next session with Professor A.K. Shukumar as well on bur the burden of uh, the crisis on women and children uh, and how do we address uh, inequalities. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for joining Thanks, us. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was a real Thanks, pleasure. Yeah, I hope Thanks, to stay connected. Thanks, everyone. Hope Thanks, to stay Anish. connected with everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.